Good morning, everyone. My name's Rick Young. I'm a professor of biology at MIT. Uh, biology, not uh, physics, math, chemistry. So my job here this morning uh, is to first give you, in this first hour, an overview of how biologists think about genome structure. Uh, and I'm going to demand that you ask questions. Because if you don't ask questions, I'm going to go through the audience. I'm going to ask you questions. So, and you'll see I do that. So, so ask me questions. I'm in the glare of lights here. So uh, you have to be doubly aggressive. You have to raise your hand and move it around a little bit. And if I don't respond, say something like, hey, Professor Young. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll discuss that. But the questions are important. So for the first hour, I'm going to talk to you about really an overview of genome structure. And we'll take a break. And then I'm going to talk to you about um, an arena that many of you may know better than I, which is uh, the role that we think that phase-separated condensates are playing in nuclear architecture and nuclear uh, processes such as gene control. OK, so this is my first slide. It's meant to just introduce the notion that cells are organized uh, such that in the nucleus, uh, your chromosomes occupy territories. Uh, within each chromosome, there are megabase size domains that we'll discuss called topologically associated domains. And uh, within those domains are gene loops, or what I'll call insulated neighborhoods. And I'm going to give you some background first to discuss uh, this. So we'll talk about the genome itself and genes, discuss gene regulation, and then we'll go into genome structure. OK, our genomes, your, your diploids, but the haploid gene content is about three gigabases. Right? So let's just think about that for a minute. Each base pair in the DNA double helix is about 3.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. You know this. And if you just think about the size of this genome, it's pretty amazing. This is what's packaged into each of your cells. So the diploid genome, 6 billion. So uh, you've probably heard this. Your genome as a polymer measured end to end in any one cell is 2.4 meters. That's a pretty. Uh, important uh, packaging problem that emerges. Uh, since you have about 30 trillion cells, your genome is almost 10 to the 14 meters. So I just want, want you to think about this as physicists, you know, what it means to package that polymer into your body. And so I, I just, you, you, you may well know this, uh, but most biologists don't. Is that 10 to the 14 meters, the distance? Is that the circumference of the Earth? How many of you think it's the circumference of the Earth? Raise your hands. No? It's not big enough. That's right. It's not big enough. How about the distance from here to the moon, which we're going to transit? OK, I've got, I've got one taker there. Still not big enough. OK, distance to the sun, right? 93 million miles. OK, we've got some takers. Any others? 10 to the, only 10 to the 11. So it actually is the distance that spans the solar system. If you use astronomers' old definition of the solar system, it includes um, Pluto, uh, which I, as a non-astronomer, think of as the outer limit of our solar system. So isn't that extraordinary? You have a biopolymer in your body, each body, in each individual body, that uh, end to end spans the distance of the solar system. I think that's extraordinary. So now that's the packaging problem. You have to, how do you package that much fiber? So before we go into packaging how much fiber, let's just talk about genes. So, so first of all, half of your genome is the product of ancient viral invasion. 
So half of your genome is not included in these numbers. Half of your genome is what we call heterochromatin. It's a silent state. We've got to keep it silent because those are ancient viral invaders. There's some, there's some very interesting DNA in there. There are the most recent viral invasions contain DNA that actually act as enhancers for some of the genes involved in early mammalian development. So don't regard that as just junk. That is more uh, portions of the genome that we understand the least. And in fact, just to emphasize that, if any of you use DNA information in your studies, what we typically do when we sequence a mammalian genome is we take those sequences, they're fragments, of course, of the entire genome, and we align them with a reference genome. That reference genome uh, was done largely by a public effort to sequence our, our genome, which ended up costing over a billion dollars. And today you can get your genome sequenced for about $300, but that's what it costs to create that reference genome. The reference genome is a mosaic of lots of people, not one person, but it doesn't include much of heterochromatin. And the reason it doesn't is because heterochromatin is repetitive and the alignment algorithms don't allow you to align repetitive DNA to a reference genome. So when you're doing any genomic analysis, keep in mind that you are not looking at this interesting half of the genome, unless you have somebody who's cleverly binning it independent, binning these repeats independent of the algorithms that everyone uses. So these are what we call genes. Um, the ones that are most studied are those that are protein coding, and there are about 20,000 of these genes. But in you and me, those genes are not a, uh, they, they are all essentially spliced. There are a few that, that do not follow this rule. But the important thing about splicing is that many animals have as many genes as we do, but are not as complex as we are. And some of the complexity, maybe much of the complexity, is derived from alternative splicing events and hopefully Professor Sharp will tell us a little bit more about that subject. But this, these are classifications we have of various human genes. So you can see it's really become quite complicated to understand what all these genes do. Um, that these, are, these are genes that we understand from the perspective of typically of function. Yet, having said that, there's some things I am calling human genes um, that are really not thought of in the textbooks as genes. So right at the bottom here, enhancer RNA. I've, I've included some of these things because um, these are the unknowns that are probably extremely important to our understanding of human biology and where hopefully some of you will play a role in uncovering what they do. I am not going to go through these details. If, if you have questions about any particular class of gene, I can talk to you about them. Um, but these RNAs, typically in textbooks and in reviews, are mostly focused on that class that produce, that are encoding proteins. But much of the regulatory biology that we study is it involves RNAs that do not have that function. And it's in that realm of the control of your genome, the control of gene expression, where some of the most interesting work is, is occurring now. Last thing I want to say about um, uh, genes and genome is the, the way you utilize this when you produce RNA. So many of the genes and the RNAs I just talked to you about are produced in all cells. And we typically call them housekeeping if they're produced in all cells. But the genes that play the roles in making each cell's identity specific to that cell, your neurons, your cardiomyocytes, your fibroblasts, 
those are genes that we call cell type specific. They may not be entirely specific, that is to say, you may have fibroblast genes that are shared by heart genes, but we call them cell type specific just to classify them. And the, it, it's become important to me and to many of us to understand as you look through these various cell types, how you differentiated into each of these various cell types. There's a, there's a genetic program of specific gene expression that leads to that. And then how you maintain the various identities you have as adult cells. Most of your cells are not proliferating. They're in, an, they're in a what we call a post-mitotic state, a non-dividing state, and they must remain in that state, otherwise uh, they're precancerous. You do have some cells in your, in your gut, your blood cells that are constantly being regenerated. We call that regenerative tissue. Um, and in fact, in, in say cancer therapies where you use um, drugs that inhibit the proliferation of cells, the, the side effects are typically those that involve those proliferative cell types, your blood system, your, your gut. So we do not yet know a whole lot about cell type specific gene expression programs, but you may know that new technologies that allow you to sequence the RNA products of individual genes and even determine the sites in the genome in each individual cell that are regulatory, those technologies are helping us identify how each cell type is different from one another. All right, you need to know a little bit about gene regulation because that's my favorite topic. I'm going to impose some gene regulation on you. So the, one of the most important things to know is that uh, genes, and in particular when we, we talk about cell type specific genes and gene identity, they are regulated by a DNA element we call an enhancer. Many of your housekeeping genes also have DNA regulatory elements. They tend to be a little more proximal to the gene, and they are not, these days, as well studied as the enhancers, because people are interested in how you get cell type specific identity. There are about a million of these DNA elements that are bound by so-called transcription factors. The the most, uh, the largest single class of protein coding genes that you have encode these transcription factors. You have about between 1,000 and 1,200 genes encoding transcription factors. Those proteins then bind specifically to these DNA sites. They do it in a combinatorial fashion. They work together. Usually an, an enhancer is about um, Oh, maybe half a KB of transcription factors. Um, they're very variable. So if we look at DNA elements that are not protein coding genes and ask which are, which are the most variable elements in the genome, the ones that differ the most between you and me are the enhancers. The ones that give us facial recognition, you know, the, this craniofacial structure is due to enhancers that came from mom and dad. And of course, in you as an individual are just as variant as you are from anyone else. So that's how I recognize you, you recognize me. So these are very important elements and there's much work in trying to understand how they function. And in the world of human genetics, trying to understand how uh, your genome, how the sequences in your genome create propensities to develop disease, and about half of us will develop some genetic disease during our lifetime. Um, most of that, disease, what's called disease-associated variation, lives in this space of enhancers. So that's why uh, these enhancers are so interesting and widely studied. The transcription apparatus. Um, the transcription apparatus, I'm going to call anything that comes to uh, 
the enhancer promoter intersection. So the way enhancers work is they're bound by transcription factors. The transcription factors bind coactivators, which are defined as transcription factors without DNA binding capability. And those interact with the RNA polymerase II enzyme. We're, most of what I'm talking about here is RNA polymerase II uh, driven transcription. And the way that enhancers work then is they loop to a target gene and at that intersection much of the apparatus is assembled for transcription. Um, as Phil Sharp and others have shown, the, the, remarkably this model is uh, an oversimplification because polymerase doesn't just assemble in this way and then transcribe down the gene. Almost at equal frequency, it initiates and transcribes in the other direction. So at most of your promoters, polymerase is initiating, and uh, about half the time it goes upstream, about half the time it goes downstream. And there are mechanisms that uh, make the downstream movement of polymerase downstream through a gene uh, the more productive part of transcription and the polymerases that go upstream then are producing RNAs that we think may play a regulatory role, but we don't understand it yet. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's an interesting point. So by necessity, everything I say to you is an oversimplification, but it provides a foundation for discussions like this. So. A wild thing is that sometimes you find that the promoter of a gene acts as an enhancer for a different gene, and and we, and we mislead ourselves. We actually see, see the transcription apparatus coming to the promoter of a gene, but actually it's not transcribing that gene. It is acting on another separate gene, and these enhancers then are very promiscuous they can loop short distances, long distances, and it's been known since their initial description that they could operate in either orientation. So the one way to think about this is that enhancers have this activity and they must be constrained. Otherwise they'll just activate anything willy-nilly. And so this is actually where chromosome ar architecture comes in to play important roles because um, there are elements called insulators that are actually, I think, loop structures, they're probably condensates that by mechanisms we don't completely understand yet, and hopefully you physicists sort this out for us, um, constrain the activity of enhancers so they cannot go just anywhere in the chromosome and activate a gene. Okay, and we'll get to that. So a few other things you need to know. Uh, your genome's folded up, and we'll discuss this, into units of packaging called nucleosomes. The nucleosomes have, uh, the core nucleosomes have in terminal tails, in terminal segments of, say, 100, 100 nucleate, <laughs> sorry, 100 amino acids. And there's a vast array of modifications that the, those nucleosomal tails can undergo that include acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, et cetera. And the enzymes that make those modifications are, have, have been colloquially called writers. They write the chemical modification. And interesting, the function of those modifications is often to enable the binding of a reader protein that with low affinity interacts with that modified residue, often a lysine. And then there are erasers, there are enzymes that remove those modifications. And so part of gene regulation is actually the production of these modifications at specific sites in the genome and their erasure and the recognition of the presence or absence of that modification. Um, all, all of the above. So there are some, it, uh, but I think in general, you should think of this as um, there's very little uh, DNA recognition specificity by the writers uh, and erasers. However, 
there are some cases, for example, there's, there's a famous polycomb uh, chromatin regulator that depends on a CBX protein that tends to recognize GC-rich sequences. So you can get a little bit of specificity in some of these spaces. Nucleosome mobilization. So your genome's packaged into these nucleosomes. Uh, we'll discuss them a little bit in a minute in greater detail, but they occupy about 150 base pairs. They wrap 150 base pairs, approximately. And there's about, depending on the organism you're studying, but in human, maybe 50 base pairs in between that we call a linker. And these things are pretty dynamic. They can be assembled, disassembled, and they can be, we call it mobilized. So they're ATP-dependent enzymes, use the energy of ATP to actually move the nucleosome translationally along the DNA. And those, eight, this BAF complex is an example of one, very complex uh, multi-subunit enzyme that uh, can mobilize nucleosomes. DNA modification. This is a very important, what we call epigenetic regulator. Um, you know, you modify DNA, it's often done at, uh, at C's, as I'm showing you here, um, and often at CPGs. Those are underrepresented in our genome. Uh, the CPG content is underrepresented in our genome uh, for a variety of reasons. But the important thing I want you to know is that you have a set of enzymes that will modify those C's, and the modified C's are then read by proteins that help silence genes. So typically, this modification is thought of as a silencing modification read by other enzymes that then keep the genes off. And finally, and it, that used to be thought of as a, a strict epigenetic regulation. It's something that once placed in the DNA would be maintained not only during that cell's lifetime, but in that cell's progeny. And that's turned out not to be true because it turns out there, there are uh, DNA modification uh, erasers. But, they, but at least this modification tends to act over a long time frame, whereas these modifications I referred to here are extremely dynamic. These modifications may only occur in a time frame of minutes, whereas you get a modification and then it's erased, whereas the DNA modifications look like they can be uh, there for the lifetime of a cell. And then finally, to, to the point that we're going to discuss now a little bit more today, chromosome structure. So we did not think of chromosome structure as an important regulator of gene expression up until maybe a decade ago. And so it's a bit of a backwater. People who pioneered this arena and tried to understand how genome structure might impact gene regulation were a very, very small number of labs. And now it's, it's viewed as a very important process. So we're going to discuss now why genome structure is thought to be so important. All right, so first of all, let, let's just discuss the span of structural features that we want to talk about today. So first, we'll talk about chromosomes. So each chromosome is a, uh, a linear, contiguous segment of DNA polymer. Uh, you have 22 uh, of these plus two sex chromosomes. Uh, each chromosome has what are called topologically associated domains. These are one, approximately one megabase segments. And within those are loops that are often called gene loops. And then the DNA, as we discussed, is, is wrapped into nucleosomes. And, and others who will be here, including Arez Lieberman Aden, are, are pioneers in this arena. So here we are, the basic unit. So the, the basic unit, this is a crystal structure that represents about 146 base pairs of DNA wrapped very tightly around what's called a histone octamer. Uh, 
and the octamer is composed of two molecules of each of these four core histones and in between each nucleosome is an approximately 50 base pair linker. The linker size differs from organism to organism. But that's the basic unit of packaging. And chromosomes appear not to be, it doesn't appear these chromosomes polymer just goes willy-nilly through the entire nucleus. It looks like they occupy what have been called chromosome territory. So segments within the nucleus. They don't have a specific geography, but they're separated from one another. And you can see this in this, this beautiful data on human chromosomes from several different uh, cell types, where these investigators have painted, for example, here chromosome 1 with red paint and chromosome 14 uh, with green paint. And the background is a Huck stain that tends to stain uh, DNA more generally. And so what you see is, is two different chromosomes painted in uh, what would be called territories. Each of these images is a single nucleus. Now this doesn't eliminate the possibility that there's some fibrous structure from any one chromosome that does move beyond these territories. But this is the concept that biologists who study this uh, have evolved based on this kind of data. So let's just think now, uh, spanning from chromosome territories down to nucleosomes, which are not represented here, what's in between? And I mentioned these things called topologically associating domains, a, a concept that was pioneered by uh, Job Decker and Bing Ren and Edith Hurd. And then what is more mysterious, what actually is the structure within each of these uh, topologically associating domains. So I'm not going to show you a lot of data on this, but just to go into the, the technology for a moment, we'll, we'll discuss. But I, what I want you to understand is that this is simply a concept that emerges from the idea that the contact frequency of any two segments of DNA is relatively high in one megabase segments. But these are thought of as very dynamic structures. These are not like a, a nucleosome, which you know, I showed you a crystal structure. And that means that you know, if you, if you can deduce from a crystal structure at atomic resolution, protein DNA interactions, they're stable enough, there's a stable enough structure to get a crystal and to solve that structure. Uh, in addition, the nucleosomes are dynamic, but in the environment in which that crystal was made, there were not the enzymes that create those dynamics. These topologically associating domains do not have such stable structures. They're very, very dynamic. And so there's no, even if you could create a crystal with such a large segment, you, I don't think you would find much in the way of a stable structure. Embedded in this are uh, what we call insulated neighborhoods, others call gene loops, some people call them uh, CTCF loops. There are lots of names for these. I like to call them insulated neighborhoods just because what we find, and I'll show you in just a minute, is that enhancers tend to operate on genes within these neighborhoods. Ah. So I hope Erez tells you quite a bit more about this because in a model that he and others have pioneered, there's something called loop extrusion. And that governs these these structures. So what happens is that you load a molecule of cohesin in this, in this view. Um, the cohesin, as you pull a loop of DNA through it, might translates down those two segments of DNA. You might imagine this blue molecule of cohesin, which is actually five protein molecules in a ring structure. And if you push that along, if there's a force that pushes that ring along, 
it will go until it's stopped by something and it looks like it's stopped by molecules of a protein called CTCF so that's illustrated here and what CTCF is doing is forming a barrier for the continued translation of CTCF now that's a mechanistic model that describes what you see in contact frequency so these two sites bound by CTCF tend to have a high contact frequency. Um, I'm also illustrating this enhancer and gene here. They tend to have a, a, a contact frequency that's above background. So those are some of the things that would tend to bring DNA in close proximity. But um, as I'll talk about over the coming hour or so, I think um, uh, biomolecular condensates are also producing some of these contacts between DNA where proteins and RNA associated with those sites will tend to coalesce. That makes sense? Okay. All right, so let's just think a little bit more about this question you just asked and, and think about how experimentally you actually get at information like contact frequency. So this is, this is um, a technique that was pioneered by uh, Job Decker with Nancy Kleckner. Um, and what, it, it, it's actually pretty simple conceptually. You just imagine that there are proteins bound to two sites in DNA that interact and bring a loop together. And we'll just call those interaction sites anchors. So there's a protein here represented by these two balls that uh, has come together uh, at two different anchors. And you can take a small molecule crosslinker like formaldehyde that will covalently link those two proteins. And now if you take your genome, which because it's a big polymer, is very viscous, hard to work with, and you shear it, you can mechanically shear it. You can just put a force on it that is mechanical. You could also shear it. You could, you could digest it, but uh, this is typically done by shearing. And then, the, you don't have to remember these names, but chia pet and high chip are names of techniques that refer to uh, a method where you take an antibody specific for the anchoring proteins, and you pull out of that complex mixture just the anchor proteins and the DNA that it's associated with. You do what's called proximity ligation. So now these, this sort of orange and yellow strands of this DNA can be ligated together. And in some experiments, you actually add a linker here that has um, target sites for uh, primers that you might use later to uh, uh, assess where the proximal segments were ligated. So now if you follow me, what's happening here is that with this purified DNA, you can analyze the ends that came together. Those are the ends that were in proximity of these anchoring proteins. And that's how you get this data. This is very, this is characteristic of all the techniques that are used to acquire data um, in uh, what's called 3C, 4C, high C, um, these are techniques, C is, the reason it's three is it's chromosome confirmation capture. And that's just a proximity assay for segments of DNA that came together. And I'm not going to go through how each of these works. I just want you to know that you can use ever more uh, complex sets of techniques that allow you to get all the way to whole genome analysis. And in whole genome analysis, then, you can infer the, the, the proximity of all segments of DNA to all with some caveats. This technique only works at the moment in populations of cells. So you're looking at a population average that is definitely not a reflection of what's going on in each individual cell. And one of the reasons I say that is because we know that these confirmations are very dynamic. Uh, and we know that because some of what contributes to 
the proximity of two segments coming together, two anchor segments coming together, is the activation of a gene that would bring an enhancer and a promoter together. And that's not a stable structure, that's a very transient structure. Questions so far? Yeah. So the most stable interactions, when, when, we're, when we look at proximity data, the most stable interactions that we see are those that are held together by two molecules of CTCF uh, and bound by cohesin. But this doesn't happen at every site that is bound by CTCF. And uh, so for every rule that we have, there are exceptions. And if you just imagine that there's an on rate and an off rate for cohesin, you can imagine why there, that this data might be very, very noisy and reflective of different things happening in different cells. So there, there at least, there's at least one important cohesin loader called NIPBL, and it's loading cohesin at these enhancer-promoter interactions. And there's at least one important cohesin unloader called WAPL that is removing cohesin from sites. So it's being loaded and unloaded. Loop extrusion is moving it along. Probably transcription, maybe DNA replication by these uh, enzymes that move along the DNA are moving the cohesin. So these dynamics uh, give you ultimately this very noisy, fuzzy data. Okay, so you can call this anything you want. I just simply call it an insulated neighborhood because uh, what we find when we analyze where enhancers interact with genes, at least in embryonic stem cells where we've done quite a bit of this work, what we find is that 90% of the time, enhancers will interact with a gene that's within the neighborhood. Now, I've oversimplified this. Typically, in a neighborhood, there's more than one gene, and there's definitely more than one enhancer. Genes like to have multiple enhancers. And, uh, but it is typically the case, 90% of the time, where we map an enhancer and its, pro and its proximity interactions, it's within that neighborhood. Interesting, if you look at the other 10% of the time, most of the interactions are in the next neighborhood. And so you, the interaction frequency drops off very dramatically with uh, subsequent neighborhoods. That's a good question. And uh, um, I, I would say kind of in a hand-waving way, yes, it drops off v very fast. but. Um, but actually, this is kind of a cutting edge question you're asking that needs much more analysis. Okay, so one of the reasons, you know, you should be skeptical about any genomic data because when you're looking across genomic data, you can find anything you want. There's examples of everything you can imagine. There's examples of the ends of chromosomes talking to one another, of uh, you know, that the, the centromere is the portion of the chromosome that is used to segregate chromosomes and cells, and you can see centromeric, telomeric interactions, you can see all kinds of stuff. But one of the tools that biologists have used to infer whether or not something you see is important is, did a cancer cell use it to evolve something that's abnormal? And cancer cells, the more we look at it, the more we find that cancer cells will delete uh, a loop anchor in order to get an enhancer to interact with an oncogene. So in cancer, you typically have two kinds of gene dysregulation. You have a gene that, that we call an oncogene that when activated can facilitate these cancer properties, and you have genes that are called tumor suppressors that get inactivated. So the combination of the two 
can lead to a cancerous state. And one of the striking things uh, when we analyze, and we've done this for a variety of tumors, but let's just say um, uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma, all of the driver oncogenes have examples from patients where there's been a mutation that eliminates one or the other of the loop anchors. And then in a proximity assay, you'll see um, an enhancer from outside the gene um, go in and activate the gene. I'm, I'm giving uh, an example here of kind of the opposite, where there's an enhancer inside an insulated neighborhood, a, a gene that's silent outside, you break the loop anchor, and now that enhancer can activate both genes. That, that also happens in these tumor cells. So the fact that tumor cells do this, and they do it recurrently, that is we see multiple patients that have the same mutation at, at the same site, affecting the expression of the same genes, uh, suggests to us that this, this structural feature of the genome is really quite important in regulating gene expression. And so this is um, just summarizing what I said. These are somatic mutations. These are not mutations that are in your germline. They're mutations that occur in the cancer cells and are not typical through the rest of your body. So let's just take a time check. I've got uh, almost zero minutes left for you to have a break. So I want to I just tell you very quickly uh, one other thing, and then I'll summarize it. So I've been arguing that, uh, and the reason I haven't showed you much data is because th this data now comes from so many labs and is so consistent that I think, and, and Erez is going to tell you more about this, you have these CTCF bound sites. They uh, they tend to arrest the migration of cohesin. So you see CTCF and cohesin together. A question that we were interested in is whether when enhancers and promoters get together, do they have an analog of CTCF that might help that? Now, I've already told you there are lots of proteins there. There's RNA there. There's lots of stuff. But it turns out there is an analog of CTCF that looks like it helps um, enhancers and promoters uh, get together. I'm not going to go through this part, which just summarizes uh, published data, but that protein is called YY1. It's in every one of our cells. It tends to bind all the ac active enhancer promoter uh, contacts. Um, this is just a summary data set of genome-wide data that says that if you look from insulator to insulator, these are these CTCF sites, then the majority of CTCF chiapat, that's a proximity ligation assay, uh, is occurring between insulators. But with YY1, it's the opposite. The majority of interactions are occurring between promoters and enhancers. So that's led to this model in which you have cohesin interacting with CTCF here and you have cohesin interacting with these YY1 molecules here. And one of the reasons I'm excited about YY1 is it's a very interesting transcription factor as a DNA binding domain. It has a protein-protein interaction domain, and it has an RNA binding domain. And so work that just came out in Cell, I think, last week argued that YY1 has a uh, a cofactor that helps it bind to RNA. And one of the functions of the RNA binding cofactor is to bind local enhancer RNA. So this is a clue, I think, to some important work that's going to happen in the future where we begin to look at um, the roles of phase separation, which I'll talk about after a break, um, in the control of gene expression because the the, um, that, the, the formation of these condensates I'll talk about is highly dependent on, pro on polymers, DNA, RNA, and protein. But to summarize this, I think uh, chromosomes tend to occupy territories. Mm -hmm.
um, within kind of a megabase domain, there's a lot of interaction. We call that interaction uh, a topologically associated domain. Within that are these specific structures form very transiently anchored by CTCF or YY1 and with a cofactor called cohesin. It, it looks like it's a former. It looks like it's sort of an adapter that uh, helps bind RNA generally. YY1's ability to bind RNA um, is, is somewhat specific. We've seen it binds some enhancer RNAs, but not others. And this other factor um, uh, looks like it makes it more general. So the model you described first is, is more tenable. That's, that's such an important question. And, and you're asking you know, something that, again, is on the cutting edge of this field. Um, it's known that when you make these enhancer RNAs, um, they are, the polymerase that makes them tends not to be very processive. The RNA itself is degraded by um, this exosome very rapidly, so they exist only transiently. So there are competing models for what those RNAs do. One is they do nothing. They're a product of um, an evolutionary process where polymerase just makes this mistake and goes in the wrong direction. Uh, or makes a mistake and produces RNA from these regulatory regions. But I think, you know, that's, that's a default explanation when you don't have better information about their function. My, my bet would be they play a variety of functional roles. And uh, my favorite bet, uh, and I have, a, I have a, a beer on this with Phil Sharp, I uh, hope I don't lose this, is that um, these RNAs are really pretty important in forming the condensates that help concentrate the transcription apparatus at active genes. All right, I should let you have a 10 minute break and get back to something I'm wildly excited about. And there are people in the audience who know more than I do about this subject. So uh, I'm on sketchy territory here. And I would invite you to be tough on me, ask some tough questions, and I'll get Ibrahim Sisi to answer them. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about biomolecular condensates, and I'm going to talk about how we think about them in gene control. So I'll start out by saying a little bit about this concept. I'll tell you why this model works for transcriptional control, and then we're going to ask some questions together. So uh, I've been teaching biology at MIT for three decades. I had the great pleasure of teaching with Professor Sharp and others who've taught me much about biology, but the way that I've taught it has, is focused, when it comes to cells, the way I've thought about it and taught it is very much centered on how your 10 billion protein molecules and RNA molecules become compartmentalized into membrane-bound bodies, membrane-bound organelles. The nucleus is my favorite. Here you are, this is nucleus, membrane-bound organelle encapsulates DNA, and that's how you segregate, say, all the transcription apparatus into a body that's going to operate on DNA, and you concentrate it there. That's, that's been the do way that has dominated my thinking about cells and how you compartmentalize. But in the last few years, what's become apparent, in some cases over decades, what's become apparent is that there are compartments that are not bound by membranes that uh, have come to be called condensates that can compartmentalize and concentrate apparatus devoted to specific functions. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But here, here are five of them. Uh, nucleoli are among the best characterized. That's where you do ribosomal RNA biosynthesis. This should be ribosomal RNA. And Fib1, all of these things in parentheses are uh, proteins that in these cases have been used as markers, but are also uh, among the scaffolding proteins for, I think, for these uh, condensates. The other 
sort of way I've had about thinking about cells is represented here where crystal structures give us atomic level resolution of what a protein or RNA or DNA structure looks like um, in a very static view. It's a snapshot, but it gives us a view toward the conformation of a protein and uh, I've long had the assumption that changes in the conformation of these proteins uh, do work and that that's largely how um, work is accomplished. But this, of course, ignores a substantial fraction of the amino acid coding capacity of the genome. And depending on where your threshold is, you can imagine that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the human proteome has segments of amino acids that have been termed intrinsically disordered. And in the old days, what that meant was, as a monomer, that protein, that portion of the protein that was intrinsically disordered, did not have an order to it without a partner. And then when it found its partner, it would be ordered and life would be good. But uh, I can only find in the literature five or six examples of this. And I'm now thinking that um, that view is not entirely right. And instead, uh, you can have portions of proteins that have this lock and key structure, where you have stereospecific interactions, they're relatively high affinity, um, they have a defined stoichiometry. There's one subunit that's green, one subunit that's blue. They interact this way. Um, but in these disordered regions of proteins, you can get a much more dynamic interaction. These are characterized in the cases I'm interested in by low affinity, high valency. So a large number of low affinity interactions with very flexible stoichiometry. You do not need to have one subunit of A and one subunit of B. You can have many subunits of, of both. And a concept that's emerged, uh, which as physicists you know for you know, the beginnings of your education, but as biologists um, we've ignored until recently, um, is that there are many uh, biomolecular condensates uh, formed in the absence of membranes that can compartmentalize and concentrate biological activities that are focused on a particular function. So they're typically membraneless. Uh, some are semi-membrane bound. I'll, I'll show you one of those in a little bit. They represent very dynamic interactions. Uh, in some cases, we think that the disordered regions or the oligomeric regions of proteins that are contributing to this behavior actually can provide something of a specific address so the protein can find its partners within a condensate. And um, this changes my view of stoichiometry. As a grad student, I would purify a protein that was actually a multi-subunit complex, and we would try and estimate the stoichiometry. There's one subunit of this, one of that, two of this, one of that. Um, in this world of condensates, uh, you don't have uh, the same view as to, uh, as to stoichiometry. Now, I just want to emphasize one additional point before I leave this slide, and that is that none of what I'm going to talk about in terms of condensates changes our view about the types of specific interactions, say, between one subunit of a protein and another subunit of a protein. Those structures that came from crystallography are still embedded, in my view, within these uh, biomolecular condensates. So I'm going to tell you a few things that uh, you already know just to remind you of some of these properties of liquid. So you can have a diffuse phase and a droplet phase. A cro you can cross a boundary. We can create a phase diagram that uh, gives us that boundary. Um, and this is just to remind you that diverse liquids can, can mix and they can demix. And when they demix, uh, they can form different phases. 
and uh, my friend uh, Arup Chakraborty and I were discussing the fact that uh, in physics um, there are a variety of models for water and how many phases water can form. Uh, that discussion just blew me away and taught me how little I understand about the physics of this. So I would invite uh, any discussion on that, on that issue. But in biology now, there are a variety of, I'm just going to call them principles. That's a very soft word. It's a, I'm going to use it like a biologist would use it. So these are really sort of emerging concepts instead of principles. But um, the proteins that are doing this have uh, domains with low affinity and high valency. Um, the, in molecular biology, the, the molecules we're most interested in, DNA, RNA, protein, are all polymers. And of course, in polymer chemistry, phase separation and condensation is not a new concept. But here, the concept is that the transcription factors I told you about earlier can be crowded on a region of the genome to a level where they may reach a uh, concentration where they demix. Uh, RNA is a frequent component of these condensates, and many proteins, in the nucleus at least, are RNA binding proteins that bind with low affinity. Um, what we often find is that proteins capable of forming these condensates that we think are phase separated in cells have two domains. They have a domain that has a high affinity, a relatively high affinity interaction with something, DNA, RNA, uh, another protein, but also a domain that is classically intrinsically disordered that is contributing to its condensate interaction properties. And this concept, I think, for us biologists, is going to become very important, and that is that liquid condensates can age and progressively move toward a solid, and there is a concept emerging that some of the small molecules, uh, like ATP, that have been so important to us for, in biology for other reasons, because of their energy carrying capacity, may play roles in uh, effectively ap ask, acting as a condensate lubricant, uh, as, as, as what the chemists would call a hydrotrope, in this new concept that we're using to think about biological regulation. So I just wanted to quickly describe some of the experimental approaches that biologists are now using to study these condensates. I'm going to show you this partly to give you a laundry list of things that we try to do uh, where the evidence we use to infer that a phase separation may have occurred, but to also give you insight into how crude a set of tools we have at this point to study these processes and how important it is that if you're interested in this, you get involved in enhancing our ability to examine these properties. So, what we try to do is to get information in cells along these lines. Um, we like to see events like fusion of, uh, of protein condensates and, and other types of evidence that I think uh, Ibrahim's going to cover in much more detail later on. Um, we also like to model in the test tube, classically in biology, what you try and do is to get evidence that something is happening in your cells, and then you get a purified form of what you think is going on, you put it into a test tube, and you model in vitro, in glass, what is, uh, what you hope is a simplified version of the more complex event in cells. And then you look for correlations. You make a, a mutation, for example, if it's a protein or an RNA or a DNA that alters its behavior in the test tube, and you ask, does that mutation give you a commensurate behavior in cells that uh, would suggest then, that correlation would suggest that you're observing something in the cells that reflects the more simplified uh, view. And there are a variety of leaders here, a subset of which I uh, 
have, uh, have listed at the bottom who, who've been pioneers in moving this arena of soft matter physics into biology. So I want to talk very briefly about why a condensate model works for transcriptional control. And let's come back to what I was saying earlier about transcription factors. And, and this began uh, partly uh, as a consequence of Phil Sharp's interest in a set of questions that were being asked of us in this course we teach at MIT. Uh, and there are always questions that we can't answer because uh, you should not assume that the textbook view of biology is anything other than a construct that represents our best interpretation of the available data. But one of the mysteries that uh, we've been facing for nearly half a century is that despite the fact that we know transcription factors generally have two domains. They have a DNA binding domain. Uh, you can create crystal structures of them and there are almost a hundred transcription factors for which we have uh, crystal structures, have atomic level solution. But they have another domain called an activation domain that is never in those crystal structures. In fact, because crystallographers have recognized they can never get a, a stable confirmation out of that domain, now they just cut it off before they even make the crystal. So only for a piece of one plant transcription factor, MIC, is there a, 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 a an X-ray level atomic resolution structure of a portion of an activation domain. Otherwise, it never been solved. And all these transcription factor activation domains share this property of being intrinsically disordered. Um, you can exchange them from one transcription factor to another. They tend to work on any transcription factor. And the cofactors they interact with, remarkably, are also highly disordered. So the interactions between transcription factors and co-activators is happening by principles that aren't easily explained by the X-ray crystal structure view of proteins. The other thing that led us to begin considering a model, a condensate model for transcription, and, and I'm summarizing uh, some work that, uh, that we published a couple of years ago together, um, and Krishna, who's here in the audience, is one of the key authors of this proposal, is that we, we knew that many genes have a enhancer that drives their expression, as I mentioned, and many genes have more than one. But what we saw was that there were some genes that had really large clusters of enhancers. And it's not a surprise that across the genome you would find clusters of things, because as I told you before, when you look at genomic data, you find anything. But what was a surprise is that they were almost always associated with the genes that biologists had discovered over decades were the most important for those cells. And I told you how, ca how important cancer cells are for convincing us that something is important in biology. Every cancer we looked at had clusters of enhancers at their driver oncogenes that were not in the cell of origin. And so we, we named these things super enhancers. We got into a lot of trouble because some people didn't like the name super, but uh, it, it garnered some attention for this class of enhancers. And uh, we began to study them further. And in some, I told you that we saw these super enhancers at driver oncogenes, but there's a striking feature, two striking features of super enhancers in cancer. One is we found instances where just three or four base pair insertions or deletions would lead to the formation of a single transcription factor binding site. That was, all, that was the only genetic change, single transcription factor binding site. But the ability of that, the, the, the newly formed single transcription factor binding site created a super enhancer. That is, it caused the other transcription factors that were already available to cooperatively bind huge segments of DNA 
producing a 10,000 base pair super enhancer that drove an associated oncogene in this cancer called TLO. And that's recurrent. Different patients were coming up with these same mutations. Maybe not exactly the same base pairs, but base pairs that would create the binding site for one transcription factor molecule. And we were able to show that if we use CRISPR to introduce that indel, it's called insertion deletion, into a normal genome, that it would recreate the super enhancer. So there's something about a single transcription factor binding site that would give us this extraordinary cooperativity. And the other thing we notice is that when we were using drugs that inhibited the activity of an enhancer binding factor, the first one of these we saw was a, a drug that inhibited the activity of a, a, a bromodomain binding factor called BET, uh, uh, BRD4. That is a reader of an acetylated lysine on a, his, a core histone. Then what we saw were these unusual behaviors of the super enhancers that were driving specific oncogenes. We saw that and there was a concentration of the drug where the super enhancer came crashing out where the associated genes stopped being transcribed at, at normal levels. And those concentrations were much lower than where you saw effects at all the other enhancers that had the same factor. So there were some very unusual behaviors of the super enhancers that led us to this model. So I just want to show you a few grad students and postdocs that played really important roles here. As I mentioned, Christian is here in the audience. Um, ben Sabari, Alessandra Dalignesi, Ann Boja, and Isaac Klein were really among the leaders of the work I'm going to tell you about. And some of this work uh, I'm summarizing from Ibrahim's lab as well. You'll hear much more about this, I suspect. So I'm summarizing a lot of evidence that, uh, that we published last year um, and, and borrowing from some of Ibrahim's work. What we now think is that many of these clustered enhancers, and I'm re representing these as these reddish-orange boxes bound by reddish-orange transcription factors, um, now form condensate structures where uh, there is a, a size I, I, I think we're focusing on a dimension with a diameter between about 100 and 300 nanometers, but Ibrahim may tell you more about this, that where there are many molecules of the coactivators, mediator is an important coactivator, and RNA polymerase too, that may come to these very dynamic condensates. And as you'll hear, the RNA polymerase now loaded into these condensates has the opportunity to transcribe almost back-to-back -back molecules down the transcription unit. And what we found was that the DNA binding transcription factors, the activation domains of those factors, were generally capable when we moved them in vitro of forming phase-separated condensates that would fuse with uh, the coactivator proteins that we've been studying. So we've coalesced around this model where you have interactions between the DNA and protein that are structured, that are represented by what we've seen at atomic resolution and crystal structures. And covalently attached to that are these disordered regions that are interacting with the disordered regions of the coactivators represented in blue that also then uh, interact with clusters of RNA polymerase II molecules. And uh, this is some work that of, of Krishna's and, uh, and my postdoc, Ben Sabari, that I just wanted to summarize very briefly, because I think it's a very elegant demonstration of uh, a, a collaboration between uh, groups that are interested in modeling how these processes work and groups that 
do experimental tests. So the idea here was to take a DNA molecule that we would synthesize and we can introduce it into cells or we can look at this DNA molecule in test tubes and to sequentially increase the number of binding sites for a specific transcription factor. So you have this represented here where we go from zero to eight binding sites within about a 300 base pair segment of DNA. And we means Krishna and Ben. So w when we made this, uh, we could then ask, is there, a, is there a density of binding site uh, occupancy where we see almost a digital transition as modeled in uh, this simulation prediction that Krishna did? And indeed, it is true that in the cell, we can see this almost digital transition uh, at a point where we add one more DNA binding site for this important transcription factor, OCT4, and that uh, that correlates with the ability to see OCT4 interact with this mediator subunit component and form a condensate in our test tube. And what I think is interesting about this, um, and you can probably get a copy of this. Well, it's at some bioarchive, so you can read it yourself. Is that this is an interesting model that would explain how a small indel in a cancer cell could form a binding site for a single transcription factor and send you over that critical point into which a condensate would form and give you transcription. And so this model provides explanations for a lot of observations that have been around for a long time. The, the model helps us understand. I told you that um, the transcription apparatus tends to initiate in either direction from uh, a regulatory element. So this is a model where it's doing that at enhancer or in, at the enhancer and a model where it's doing that at promoters. And because RNAs are components of many condensates, we suspect that these RNAs are being made at these active sites are contributing to condensate formation or condensate lifetime at, uh, at these enhancer promoter interactions. So that, that's, a, that's a proposal. And I told you about YY1. It binds DNA, it binds RNA, it, it turns out that it's also at these sites, not in a one-to-one -one relationship the way I modeled it earlier, where there's a molecule of YY1 bound to an enhancer anchor and a molecule bound to a promoter anchor, and they get together. Uh, that's no longer the way we think about that, but rather we think that uh, it's super stoichiometric and, um, and that that's how it works. So again, a model for experimental analysis. But that would help us explain this question we had before of well, what is the function of, of these regulatory RNAs. Um, there have been two groups that have reported in the last couple of years that enhancers that they've been studying that are important in various types of biology come to the genes they regulate but don't get closer than about 300 nanometers. And for a couple of years, that's been presented as a conundrum that we thought that enhancers and promoters get together. They're a much closer proximity than 100 to 300 nanometers. And uh, now uh, it's thought that this model, and particularly Wendy Bickmore has been presenting this, although I haven't seen her paper on this yet. I think there's one in bioarchives. She has been presenting that data in this context. And we've known for a little while from Anna Pombo's lab that um, super enhancers that are on one chromosome, because for example, your chromosome one is the largest chromosome. I don't know how many super enhancers it has in any one cell type, but uh, let's just say it has 20. What she's shown is that each one of those 20 tends to interact in DNA proximity assays with, this, with other super enhancers on the same chromosome. So one explanation for that is a model akin to what 
many years ago were called transcription factories. Uh, you can think about this in a variety of different ways. But what I've modeled here is something that's actually been seen for a long time in nucleoli, where the ribosomal RNA, the ribosomal DNA repeats that are used to transcribe ribosomal DNA are on five human chromosomes. And you can see um, experiments where each of it, the portions of each of those five chromosomes are embedded in the nuclear condensate uh, where pre-ribosomes are being made. So one of the things that we've noticed is that, I think I've mentioned this before, is that whether we're talking about these transcriptional condensates, OC4 as a transcription factor, BRD4 as a, is a reader of a histone modification, where each of these seems to have a structured domain that can engage with a specific binding partner. And each of these has a disordered domain that can either promote condensate formation or engage in it. And what seems to be emerging for us, whether it's a euchromatic condensate or a heterochromatic condensate that also involves uh, DNA binding proteins and nucleosome readers, um, a common theme has been that, that these proteins can have both kinds of domains within one polypeptide. That may not be universal, but it is for these proteins that we think are playing especially important roles. So I want to run through some questions just to intrigue you and try and get you more engaged in what is in really just an extraordinary new field. So the, there, the reason you can understand anything or not understand anything I'm saying is because you're using your neuronal capacity to receive signals that go through what is called a postsynaptic density. The postsynaptic density was named because in electron micrographs, it was very clear that the components of this receiver of neuronal signals are at extremely high density. And so last year, a Hong Kong group showed that actually the postsynaptic density is a semi-membrane bound condensate. They reconstituted this in vitro. And I think it's just amazing that what is going on now with respect to cognition and emotion is dependent on a biomolecular condensate that has a single paper describing its condensate properties, but an entire field of neurobiology focused on how this apparatus works. Right now, your immune system is highly active against antigens that come from your microbial flora, antigens that are invaders, precancerous cells, much of what is going on in that interaction between uh, T cells in this case and the, uh, the cells that it is recognizing involves signal transduction, something that Arup Chakraborty's lab study for many years that involves a condensate where the components have been shown to produce phase separated condensates in vitro in a reconstituted reaction. Again, uh, just in the last few years. Nutrition and metabolism, the, the, it turns out that the uh, substantial fraction uh, of the enzymes that are involved in specific kinds of metabolism are forming condensates. But these are a different type than the ones we've been studying in the nucleus. These are, these are polymeric and have some interesting and different properties uh, as far as they've been studied. So I want to leave you with just a few key questions uh, at, at the interface of, of this field, physics, chemistry, and biology. We don't know, since we, we don't have models for the structures of these portions of proteins, we don't have a complete understanding of what Tony Hyman calls the molecular grammar of condensates. 
So we don't know what amino acid structures, what amino acid components are playing roles in creating the specificity that we know must, must exist because we know that some condensate proteins will enter certain condensates but not others. We don't know how these are regulated in cells. And when, when a cell undergoes mitosis, it breaks down the nuclear envelope and you dilute proteins that were in the nucleus into the cytoplasm and the condensates, the nuclear condensates all dissolve. So as you might predict, they're highly sensitive to the concentration uh, in their compartments and uh, during this mitotic phase, they dissolve and as soon as the nuclear envelope is re configured proteins move back and RNA move back into the nucleus, the condensates reform. There's some very limited data that argues that a class of kinases called the DYRKs are involved in this somehow, but that's the extent of our understanding of, of that type of cell cycle dependent regulation. I, I told you earlier this morning that uh, enhancers harbor much of the disease-associated variation, the, the variation that makes each of us have a slightly different propensity to develop a, a genetic disease. And uh, now that you know that, that multiple enhancers in clusters can come together and regulate a gene, uh, you should wonder if the human geneticists have incorporated this thinking into the way that they model what genes are actually responsible for disease. Because so far, the standard algorithm is, I see a variant, it's in an enhancer, it must be affecting the gene that's proximal. I think at least 30% of the time, that is not correct. Um, what diseases are driven by these condensates? I told you that the disease-associated variation exists in, in enhancers. It is especially prominent in these clusters of enhancers that are driving uh, what we call cell identity genes. Um, there are pathological condensates. The, the condensate forms that exist in Alzheimer's we call amyloid plaques. Um, there are, in Parkinson's disease, a, a body called uh, a Lewy body. Uh, when I talk to pathologists um, in various areas of medicine, they all tell me that there is a literature in, the, in their medical specialty of unusual bodies, each with names of their discoverers, and very little understanding of what they are. But a fascination any time they come to learn that actually there's a a world of biology where condensates live. So um, one question is, are these condensates that we now know in these neurodegenerative diseases, are these, these solids, which are not reversible, uh, it would appear, uh, is this a way of thinking? That is the condensate world where you go from liquid to gel to solid, is this something to think about if we want to try and prevent uh, these these diseases that affect so many of us. And what are the implications for small molecule drugs? I, I know my friends in the uh, industry who do drug development um, have this amazing ability to envision what kinds of small molecules might be efficacious in, in attacking a specific target, a protein target typically. Um, but almost none of them have thought about what is the what, what it would be the consequence if their target of their small molecule actually lives within a condensate that may be partitioning that small molecule in an un unanticipated way. So I think that's a, a new and interesting space to work in. So you've been terrible at asking me questions. So now it's time. Yes. <laughs> 
So your, neur your neurons are uh, post-mitotic. However old you are, that is pretty much how old your neurons are. So they don't go through cell cycle, so they're never renewed. So whatever liquid like condensate was formed a couple of decades ago, unless that remains liquid, um, you have these pathologies. That's one way of thinking about that. Um, and the answer is no, I don't, uh, in, in a cell that renews by going through the cell cycle, um, you know, a candidate there would be a cancer cell. Um, we, we haven't done that investigation to answer your question in a, a renewing cell, in a cell that's actually going through the cell cycle. But in cells that are very long-lived and post-mitotic, like neurons, that's where you find these pathologies. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, 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 is there an emergent property of having multiple enhancers relative to one where you, you just have one enhancer? And, and I think the answer is yes. I think those properties, um, uh, I gave two examples, one where you have this exquisite sensitivity to the addition of one new molecule in, uh, in the formation of a huge apparatus. We haven't seen that. Um, although I must admit we haven't looked very hard in typical enhancers, but also this behavior of um, being exquisitely sensitive uh, to a small molecule drug. You know, I would have thought naively that as I add a drug for a factor that exists at all active genes, that first it would kill the genes with few of those factors, and the others that would have lots of redundancy would be less sensitive. It, it's the opposite in this case, and so it's a different property than I would have expected. Yes? Starting this month, they're doing that. But that's, it's, it's done very rarely, and that's a, it's a very insightful question. It, it, way back in the history of transcription factors, people would do those swaps, and in other kinds of biology, people would do swaps to try and understand um, how independent a domain was in performing those activities. But that type of experiment and many other types are now being used to explore what amino acid residues are most important for these kinds of behaviors. So I think I've got to give you a break so we have a little bit of room between now and the next topic. So thank you very much.